Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Cultural, Culture, People, Strategy, How an Old Company Learned New Tricks. Today's hosts are Margaret Graziano, Chief Evangelist of Keen Alignment and Employee Optimization Strategist. The co-host is Michael Lowe, General Manager of ABNI Foundry. Maji, take it away. Good morning and thank you for being with us. And Michael, thank you for giving your time and energy toward sharing your story. My pleasure. And so today we're gonna to talk about how an old company learned new tricks. And, and if you are watching this webinar, you know, because you've got your eye on culture, that it is important to everybody right now. There's documented and validated research and results that companies that focus on culture outproduce companies that don't by 202%, by up to 202%. And we're gonna tell you how ABNI Foundry and Keen Alignment worked together to move the organization into the 21st century. So let's get started. So first of all, let's talk about the current state of the workforce. Um, I get research every day and some of the interesting research that I've been, that I've gotten an opportunity to, to, to see is that 68 to 72 percent, it depends on who's doing the survey, if it's Gallup or Society of Human Resources Management, but between, between 68 and 72 percent of employees are disengaged with their current work doesn't mean they're working for a bad organization. It means they do not feel connected to what they're doing. 58% of employees do not trust their direct supervisor. 58% do not trust their direct supervisor or the business leaders of the organization. 80% of CEOs and senior level leaders when asked believe the number one pe reason people leave is for more money and actually only 12% of people leave for more money. The truth is 80% of the reasons people leave have to do with culture, how it feels around there, what the, what, how connected they are to their work, that they understand the purpose of the business that they're supporting, that they can trust their executives, that they feel included, and that they believe the company practices diversity or operates with diversity, that they feel there's a bright future for themselves. These are the reasons people are really leaving. And some other current work world statistics that more and more people are choosing to leave the regular workforce to become contractors because they feel like they have more control over their own destiny. So Michael, why don't you give a, a little bit of insight into the current state of manufacturing um, and specifically the found, maybe macro manufacturing and then foundry in the US. So um, based on my experience at AB&I, we're a 113 year old manufacturer here in Oakland, California. Uh, I would articulate that Manufacturing over the last couple of generations has gone to, you need to be regionally competitive, to nationally competitive, to internationally competitive today. And I believe any uh, sizable manufacturer today needs to be able to compete with China, India, as well as uh, local uh, North American competitors. And uh, what's, the, what's the state, would you say, of uh, finding new talent for manufacturing and um, how AI and robotics will shift? What's your feeling? I know you spend a lot of time politically getting involved and, and working for the rights of manufacturing. What, what, what do you see in the area of recruitment, in the area of um, Automation. I believe the uh, uh, the word industrial is now taken as a pejorative, and that many of the millennials and, and, and Gen Z behind them don't realize 
what a wonderful opportunity working in manufacturing, making tangible things um, and, and growing within that structure can bring to their careers. I think it's an afterthought. I, I, I don't believe people intuit that things can be made here in the United States, be competitive on a world stage, and that they can have a, a really solid uh, career and grow and learn and be part of some, some magic. So from recruiting, um, we are an afterthought. And you know, back to uh, Maji's intro, it's all culture. Yeah. That the reason why we have an average tenure of 19 years um, I say if we can get somebody in here for six months, they'll stay five years. And if they stay here five years, it, they'll retire from here. It's largely true, and it's because of the culture. It's not because of the product. Um, so uh, manufacturing to be able to gather an unfair share of talent needs to be an attractive workforce uh, we happen to be nearby uh, Silicon Valley with, I grew up in Silicon Valley with Google and Apple and all those starting. Um, they, they've they attracted a lot of talent because of culture and because they were part of something sexy. We might not be part of something sexy, but we can certainly um, attract talent with culture. And we've been working on that for the last two years with Keen. So let's talk a little bit about what is going on in the current work state. So we, at this point in our life, we are some of the luckiest people on the planet because we get to work with five different generations of talent. What the five different generations of talent pose as, as challenges for organizations is the folks that are in the Walter World War II generation that, 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 that are that age. So I would say, 70s or higher, um, there, we, a lot of people think they're not around anymore, but I serve several companies where these folks are on the board, they're still walking the halls, they still have an impact. They grew up in a very, very different time. They grew up in survival mode, and so a lot of the infrastructure that they created in organizations worked 60 years ago. And many of the organizations like military, uh, healthcare, uh, government, um, uh, uh, religion still have many of, this in, many of this infrastructure in place. And these are the folks that mentored these folks. And so the boomers grew up in a time where it was, let's, <clears throat> let's have collective action. Let's fight against the man. Let's be independent. Let's create teams. Then the Gen Xers grew up in the time where the divorce rate skyrocketed and where enterprise collapsed. And so these people, and I know I'm making gross generalizations, but it, it's important to understand somebody's come from when you understand how to create a culture that would be, speak to them. The Gen Xers are much, much more cynical. They saw the downfall of uh, major technology companies, uh, WorldCom and, um, and I, of course I can't think of it right, Enron and 9-11, they were at very uh, informative ages and they also saw the collapse of the American family. And so these people are very independent, but the people that raised them as their bosses are saying, no, you gotta work as part of teams. Then we get the millennial, which gets the bad rap and we need to understand that in a decade, millennials will be seven, under a decade, millennials will be 75% of the workforce these folks are extreme multitaskers. They understand how to use technology to cut right through and get something done. However, they don't have a lot of people skills. They were raised with their thumbs, communicating even to their parents, uh, hello at dinner, and when will I see you, you know, like this. And they do the same thing at work. The, the other thing that's important to notice about millennials is they travel in packs. If you can recruit a millennial who loves your company, they will bring their friends. And then you've got your, your Zach Generation Z who's just kind of entering as Walter's leaving, Zach is entering and he's very skeptical that there's even a place for him or that he's gonna get the training and development that he needs. And by the way, 
so are the millennials. But here's one thing about all generations. People want purpose. Maslow's you know, hierarchy of needs is purpose and meaning, fulfillment, self-actualization is when you're like 70 years old and you're done. And that's what, that's what this generation thought was the way it was supposed to be. This generation is, hell no, I want it now. And the millennials are holding us to task for that. So everybody wants to be connected with the company's vision and know they have a positive future and know they're contributing and know that whatever they give to the business, they're going to get back tenfold. There is no work-life balance. We are living in times of work-life integration. People are at work all the time. I'm on an airplane at midnight and people are working. I'm on an airplane at, at 10 in the morning and the majority of the plane is working. They're not watching movies because we're always hyper-connected. Safety used to be Safety was about not killing people at work or having everybody go home with all their limbs. Uh, but now safety is about emotional safety, that people can say what they need to say, that they have a boss that cares about them, that's considerate about where they're up to. And all people want to be excited and feel like what they're doing matters. And this is the crux of culture, is understanding the psychographics of what people need. And the other thing I want to say is why it's so broken now is what worked for these generations was let's get the work done. Let's focus on the task at hand, which was natural and normal in that era. But as the human being has become more evolved, more aware, as technology has, as it is at our fingertips and we could see what's going on in any step of the world, in any place, at any time, people are more aware and awake to what is. They're also more self-aware. They also do more work in introspection on themselves. And so they're waking up and the corporate world has not woken up fast enough to understand how to make that happen. What most companies are doing is spending money on incentives or having parties or having outings. That's not enough anymore. People want to know that you care about them. They want to know that you care about their well-being and their future, whether they're with your company or not. Psychographics, I can't say enough about how important they are. So let's also look at workplace psychology. Many, many people are holding on to their job until they can find something better, until they can find something that is more meaningful, or they know they're five years away from retirement, so they're kind of just holding on so they can get that pension. And that's very real. We call it warm chair attrition. Then we've got corporate cocooning as people are aging and in their heart, they see from the 80s, because they were around in the 80s, that they might be aging out, which I don't believe is true anymore, but I could talk about that in a minute. So they're protecting themselves. They're building walls around their knowledge and not sharing their knowledge. And it's really killing the new people coming in because this group must train this group or you're gonna have a massive void. So we have to make it safe for aging people to share their knowledge. There's a book out there called From Aging to Saging. And whenever I encounter a person that's three to six years away from retirement, I really talk to them about what would be possible if you became a mentor, if you became a coach, if you could really share everything in your brain with the new people. And if you weren't in fear of losing your job, but your whole purpose was to make sure this place is going to work without you. And, and when I tie it to their pension, if they have pension, they really do start listening. But also when I tie it to their purpose. And then work-life navigation, even though I just said work-life integration, people want to know if they give an extra 10 hours a week, if they volunteer on committees, that you're going to give them a break, that you're going to allow them time off for good behavior if their kids got a play or a soccer game, and they're not going to have to punch in and punch out or have to use their 10 hours of PTO. They want to know that it's a give and a take, and it's a mutual trusting relationship. And we do see organizations in Silicon Valley throwing out the paid vacation and saying, if you're producing, if you're meeting your number, we trust you. Not everybody's doing that, but there are a few people that are trying that out and piloting programs. We also have the workplace psychology that the employees, the team members, believe loyalty must be earned. I'm not gonna give you my loyalty 
I'm going to give it just because I take your paycheck. You need to earn my respect. You need to earn my loyalty. And as Michael uh, will talk about further, AB and I has done a really good job of creating a culture that people matter and people want to stay. And then the employees are smart. Remember I talked about in the last slide that in the world that we're living in right now, people understand that everything's changing. There's people leaving, there's people coming in, but there's also this advent of I, internet of things and sensors and robotics. And while they've been here a long time, they are moving forward with great momentum and velocity. And 30% of the jobs that exist today will be gone. And anybody who's Googling and researching um, is learning that if they're not marketable, if they don't develop themselves, if they don't develop resiliency and the ability to be agile, they will be a thing of the past. And so people need and know they need to stay marketable. So it's a wake up call and it's a wake up call that we understand that what's going on out there is engagement is at an all time low. That one third, almost one third of everybody in a job feels that the job is not a match for them. That it was told that it was one thing, but it turned out to be quite another thing or they weren't told what the performance expectations were and then they get the job and now they're told you need to produce, you need to do this, you need to do that. We also have a sparse bench and we don't have enough people that we're grooming for leadership roles so we're not proactively recruiting and I'm gonna have Michael talk in a minute about what ab and has done to counteract that. And then there's this massive competency gap because if you have, let's say, 40% of the workforce is retiring or changing the way they work, and 45% of the workforce is coming in, you have a massive competency gap of intellectual knowledge, of intellectual property, of intellectual capital that is leaving your organization with no plan to retain that knowledge. And then every person in a decision-making role who cuts the check for people initiatives needs to know what the ROI is, and most HR people do not focus on the return on investment or the mathematics behind why they should do initiatives like culture, like recruiting, like changing their hiring process, like transforming the entire experience of what it is to work at this company from hiring, onboarding, coaching, mentoring, performance management, learning and development. So Michael, I want you to talk a little bit about what, what was the day or the moment you said, holy cow, we're in trouble uh, with this competency gap, with the eight, eight people aging out, um, with people being in the wrong jobs, um, not having a bench, all of it. What would you say to that? So, uh, thank you, Mike. So, uh, a little bit about our history. We started in 1906. So, look, when I consider myself part of the fourth generation of, of this company, the third generation, which in Maji's uh, previous slide would be the Walter generation. We were run up until recently by that generation and some very forward thinkers. Um, the, the owner of the company at that time and started in the 80s, uh, open book management, uh, no time clocks in a unionized workforce, profit sharing, treating people with uh, dignity and respect and expecting them to think and act like owners, decision-making on the floor. So very, very forward thinking. And as he turned over um, management responsibility to son-in-law, the next generation, uh, those same values uh, were not upheld. And, and we started from a culture standpoint going backwards. So Maji, when did I start realizing that we were in trouble? Um, you know, it was it was self-evident. I was I was asked by the uh, previous owner uh, to become the general manager um, with the express idea that uh, you know we needed to save the culture. Um, and so when I started, it was very clear, and that was three years ago as a general manager that uh, we had a lot of turbulent water ahead because the uh, the World War II generation was going to retire and the baby boom generation both concurrently were going to retire 
within the three to five years. We're now three years later, and they have. So how do you save the culture, uh, which really means make, the, make what was working at the old culture relevant to the millennials and, and the Gen Zs, and how do you also concurrently um, come up with a succession planning to put, put the talent that was nascent inside the company into the right roles and do it um, while transforming the culture. So it was, uh, it was mission number one when I became gen, uh, general manager, Maji, three years ago. Awesome. Thank you. So Gallup, and, and by the way, every day I get about 15 different Google alerts. And there are, if I listed every place that I got research from, there would be 50 people, 50 different organizations on this page. This survey comes from Gallup and the Workforce Institute. The cost of disengagement in the United States adds to about 450 to 550 billion dollars a year, which is about between two and three percent of the GDP. Only, out of that, only 35 percent of the people leading other people actually like what they're doing. And, I, and it's kind of obvious, common sense, the more engaged the manager, the more engaged the team. And this is a, this is a kicker right here, only 10% of the workforce and 18% of people in leadership roles believe they're qualified to lead other people. So we just have this, this dearth of leadership and not a real plan to fix it. And then the top driver of engagement is that people must feel compelled by what they're doing and where they're working. So these are what the problems are. And um, I want Michael, you to talk a little bit about your business, AB&I, what you do, and, and um, the current state of AB&I as of two years ago. So um, AB&I uh, makes what we call cast iron soil pipe. It's the uh, drainage pipe within uh, large buildings, high rises, hotels, hospitals, stadiums, large apartment complexes, et cetera, schools, universities. Um, it's not sexy. When you flush, think of us, we're the, we're the drainage pipe that uh, goes out to the sewer of the storm water. Um, we make it out of recycled material, 100% recycled automotive scrap. And uh, it's, it's you know, uh, old school. We pour molten metal into molds and, uh, and it's, very, very, uh, you know, heavy manufacturing. Um, so three years ago, when I became general manager, uh, there was a tremendous amount of siloization, goal incongruity, where one department was uh, all well-intended going off to do the right thing, but there was no coordination between uh, directions uh, there was a feeling like Camelot had just gone by the wayside and that the culture was changing for the negative and uh, uh, a palpable lack of energy. A few huge drivers and a lot of followers that were not convinced in the direction that we were going. Um, and like, then... Can you talk can, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you talk about what you mean about a, hu a few huge drivers when it comes to constructive and destructive um, and what those drivers were causing in, this, in the environment? So the culture that was there three years ago, um, it was a, a bit of the survival of the loudest or strongest and, and most um, domineering. So again, people with very, very well-intended directions, but it was um, in the absence of leadership at the top, um, the next layer down was, um, it was, it was, they were being dominant uh, for dominance sake. And if people didn't listen, uh, they just got steamrolled. So it created this dependency slash, you know, uh, you know, strong person at the top 
dynamic. So 10% of the people were were leaving and 90% of the people were just rolling with the punches. Um, or avoiding, or it, avoiding the punches. Or avoiding the punches. But then there was no continuity of, of strategy. So um, we, were, we were literally spinning, um, I would say swirling down. I, I truly believe had we uh, continued on that, uh, that path, with the big challenges that uh, we started experiencing last year um, would have been um, very difficult for us to um, succeed in, which, which we ended up doing. Um, so the, the, the work to be done was, one, getting people to coalesce around a common vision, and one that they had ownership in helping to create, and then creating um, a new generation of leaders, which these, some of these very people that I called domineering and were uh, subjugating the 90%, it wasn't, they were the right leaders. They just didn't have the right tools mm -hmm. in order to collaborate and, and really unleash their better, their better selves. And so, um, they were the right people in the right role with the wrong mindset and with, 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 with um, not collaborating. So the work to be done was really to, um, to wade through all of that what wasn't working about their style and, and to come together with a common vision of in order to survive as a heavy manufacturer making a, basically a commodity product you have to be the low cost manufacturer in the world. And in order to do that, which we had once been, I believe still are, um, you had to come together and be collaborative and realize that it's the people on the floor uh, that you see here in these photos, that's where the best ideas come from. That's where um, the people who have the most experience on what works and doesn't work in terms of the little tweaks in order to make it a little bit better, a little bit faster, a little bit cheaper, safer, and cleaner. How do you unleash that talent? I'm a big believer in the upside down pyramid that our job at the bottom is to support the talent and give them the tools, resources, and clear sense of direction above. And uh, so we started at the bottom with the executive team and then to the new, newly formed superintendent team to all get on the same page. And uh, we're a different company today. We are, you know, Walter and I think Barbara and your slide, they're retired. You know, the, we're, we're now a company led by um, Gen Z, uh, excuse me, Millennial and Gen X. Um, and, and looking forward to Gen Z entering. They're, they're going to round the corner. So it's a little bit about our story, Mom. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to talk about some of the framework that Keen Alignment uses in working with organizations to have them realize their full potential and break down the barriers of silos and remove the obstacles such as aggressive personalities thinking the only way they can get things done is through power and force. And the first thing we introduce to our organizations, and as Michael said, it always begins with the people in his pyramid at the bottom, but in most other organizations, it begins with the executive team, the people making all the decisions. If the executive team is not bought in to the need for cultural alignment, it will not work. If Michael Lowe himself was not as involved as he was and as committed, it would not have worked. And there are organizations I've worked with where it didn't work in the long run because the executive wanted to delegate it to someone else or the executive thought it's really good for all of you people, but if I wanna scream and yell and if I wanna demoralize people, well, I'm just gonna do that. And so um, Michael is a, an awesome example of how to do it right and that's he's been all in, he's been all in from day one and he, he ultimately understands that the better he takes care of his people, and I'm not saying coddling his people, but holding his people accountable, putting them in the right jobs, 
giving them the right resources, giving them the right training that they can operate above the line. So let's talk about the seven levels of personal group and organizational effectiveness. When companies or individuals are operating below the power and freedom line, when they are hopeless, in hopelessness, fear, or frustration, they are much less effective. And I'll tell you exactly how less. So when people are in hopelessness, this is the fundamental inability to see that things could ever get better. There were people at ABNI in hopelessness. When we led the level set, Michael had, had us do um, eight level sets at his company. Many people came into the level set, not the executive team, but everybody who wasn't came in with the mindset of, uh, I'm really frustrated. I don't see that it's, I, I, don't, I don't see that it's gonna get better unless I keep doing what I'm doing because what I'm doing works or I'm afraid that these changes are gonna change me or I won't fit in anymore or I won't know how to do it or hopeless. Like I just don't trust that it will ever get better. In hopelessness, people experience happiness less than 5% of the time at work. So when you've got people that have given up, when you've got people that have given up on their, their projects or themselves, less than 5%. So Sean Anker who wrote The Happiness Advantage and companies like Microsoft and Satya Nadella and Tony Shea at Zappos. And there's enough evidence now that when people are happy, they produce. When people are unhappy, they not only don't produce, but they create more unhappiness. In fear, this is where you're resisting or grasping for something you need. So you're longing or pushing away. And so you can't, you can't necessarily be in the moment. You can't be present with what's going on around you because you're operating in fear. And in fear, people are only happy 14% of the time. In frustration, this is where I'm right, you're wrong, power and force, get it done. You people better get it done. You know, the hammer. This is where siloing happens and infighting happens. And you have entire departments that don't talk to other departments or people in departments that go around to six other people to get something done. In frustration, people are only happy 25% of the time. Now, frustration is the highest level of ineffectiveness. Why? Because people have had enough and they're, they wanna make a change. This is the mother of invention. But if people stay in frustration too long, innovation stops, collaboration stops, and, and it just falls apart. And a great company, uh, a great CEO that's willing to tell the truth about that is Satya Nadella at Microsoft. When he came on the scene, Microsoft had stopped innovating. They were not a collaborative environment. It was dog eat dog and open warfare for each other's jobs. So departments were not sharing information. New people were coming on board and watching how dog eat dog and cutthroat it was, and they didn't want to be part of it. And what happens in a frustration environment is one day it starts as competition. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna kick the competitors' butts, and then they start competing against each other. And Michael, I want you to talk a little bit about the oppositional culture that was developed at ABNI out of survival, not even intentionally, but in surviving in the world of making it in heavy manufacturing, how frustrate or how opposition became the way of working. So one of these tools, uh, Maja, I forget what it was called, but remember that little chart with the, uh, ideal, the ideal, it's ideal culture? Ideal, ideal culture, it's a circumplex on ideal culture. So um, a series of questions and it ends up with this, this circle chart, it's almost like a, uh, like a paint spin wheel, and, and in one quadrant, this quadrant up here, is all the humanistic values of, of, of harmony and, and empowerment and people get along and, and, and all the things that you would high, instinctively... High achievement. Go ahead. High achievement. High achievement. Instinctively want, and, uh, um, and, and certainly uh, a, a direction I thought would be the right way to go. Um, and what came out of uh, this survey was looking at what we considered was the collective ideal culture and what we had. And um, surprisingly, what in the ideal we wanted, and it turned out we had it, was uh, opposition. 
I'm right, you're wrong, competition where I get by by making you wrong, mm. and this kind of dominant, su- submissive culture. So we had this, um, right you know, we, we, you know, back to the idea that if you think it, it'll happen, we wanted an oppositional, confrontational, domineering culture, and darn it, we, we achieved it. But why, um, why was that opposition, how did that opposition get born? So it was born out of innocence, right? It wasn't that you, you, you know, share a little bit about what happened in the, I think it was the 80s or 90s when you guys were in survival mode. So, so in the, uh, in the 90s, um, as, uh, you know, in, in the recession there in the 90s, and there was, a, there was more competition in our industry, more capacity than the, there was demand. Um, so there was a, a big shakeout in the 90s um, of quite a number of founders that make our product went out of business. And we came really, really close to that. And, uh, you know, why did little Abe and I with some much larger uh, better finance companies come out of that. Um, the, the the third generation leader owner then um, really led by bringing everyone together. They gave up uh, they gave up pay. They gave up um, work longer hours in order to come together and beat the odds um, to literally keep the doors open. All the money they had given up eventually got paid back. But um, it became a, uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to win or lose together. And, and that generation won. Um, There's also then, as they came together, all of the, uh, the Chinese imports started coming in at dumped and subsidized prices, which put quite a number of other foundries out of business. Uh, we were able to survive through that. So there was this... Um, you know, we call it Patron around here, but uh, there was a strong leader at the top who led people through the troubled waters, but he led them through the waters by supporting them and empowering them and engaging them, sharing all the information and, and, and nurturing the best ideas that come off of the floor. Uh, so when he, the absence of his leadership, when he, um, handed over the, the responsibility to the next generation, um, there was a vacuum. And that vacuum got filled, not at the top, but at the next layer down by people that were also dominant. But um, they were not, they were more ego-based and not collaborative-based. It's, it's, I'm the smartest, strongest, so follow me. I think that's where it came from. Strongest, smartest, loudest, um, forceful. Yeah. And so what happened at ab and is they had this aggressive, defensive group of people that were making it happen and everybody else was passive defensive, like staying out of the line of fire or waiting to be told. And then when Michael takes over, he's like, I want empowerment. And even when Michael was put in that job by the Walter World War II, third generation leader, um, or three generations ago leader, he said, I want you to bring back what I had. And, and people just didn't understand it. So let's talk a little bit about the power and freedom. When people are encouraged, when they step out of frustration and they say, hey, it's not working. I want something better. That's where it all begins. Encourage. People are happy 50% of the time. They believe that a positive future can happen. They trust and they are resolved that they're gonna move forward and make it happen. Everything happens in courage, which is what our level set program is really about. People have the opportunity to come together and to tell the truth about what's not working, what's in the way, not who's not working, not who's in the way, but what's not in the way. And then they come together to solve 
the problems. And then let's move up into engagement where you go from talking about what's not working to actually engaging and making it better. And this is where motivation and tolerance for others, this is where diversity shows up. This is where inclusion shows up. This is where people give more of their time to the organization to make it better and make it happen. In engagement, people are happy 78% of the time. So what do you think happens to performance? It accelerates. People work together. There's less dogma down here. I, I work with a company that does um, clean water uh, filtration and they're, they're also manufacturing. And when we had our first meeting with everybody about ideal versus actual culture, people started telling the truth. And this is 30 people in a room with the CEO and they are um, private equity backed, so they're funded. And they said that they were in frustration, 30 people, all leaders in frustration. I said, how much time do you think you waste doing rework, working around people, arguing, or in drama and conflict, and they said 45% of their time. The CEO's face turned white, his jaw dropped, and uh, he, he, for the first time, got the impact of not addressing the people issues in the company. So, uh, so anyway, I wanted to give you an example of that. In innovation, objectivity, and openness, this is where people are coming up with brand new ideas and new thinking and highly creative and they're riffing off of each other and brainstorming. And this is truly where most people in, in the world today would like to work, but very few companies get there. In innovation, people are happy 89% of the time. And in synchronicity, this is where everything is in sync. People are actually at the level of emotional intelligence that they get whatever they see happening in the outside world is a reflection of how they feel inside. And they get over themselves much faster. They recalibrate much faster. They get back on the horse and are resilient much faster and things flow. Now the truth is most companies don't call me and say, I wanna be in synchronicity. They call me and say, can you please get us into engagement? We need to raise our level of performance and we think it has something to do with culture. Reality is it has everything to do with culture. You might think it's your product. You might think it's your mission. You might think that you've got a few bad leaders, but it, it's everything to do with the system of humans that are working together for a cause. And if people are not aligned, if they don't believe, then they get into all this mischief. There's a great book called Sapiens and Harari says, whenever you get a hundred people or more together, if they are not aligned by a common cause, they self implode. And that's frustration, fear, and hopelessness. So let's talk about leadership effectiveness. It all begins with you. Whoever is watching this, if you're a strategic HR person or a CEO or a general manager or somebody that's been tasked with culture, it begins with you, which is why I say Michael's a model customer because he understood he, it begins and ends with him. If he wasn't bought in, if he didn't stick in the, in the stand in the fire when other people, even on his leadership team, were pushing him not to do this, and there were people pushing him not to do this, they were in deep fear that they wouldn't be able to change, he knew that it was up to him. And, and, and that means self-awareness, using your prefrontal cortex, your executive brain, understanding how it works, understanding that we have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere, and the right hemisphere is about empathy and people and collaboration. And the left hemisphere is about bottom line results. If you are not fully integrated, you can't make this thing move forward. If it's all about the results and not about the people, people will rebel. If it's all about the people and not about the results, your numbers will rebel. Uh, teaching people and you about response agility, this ability to recover quickly from adversity, pressure, stress, breakdowns and get back on and be resilient and also understanding the whole system the people the work they're doing and the big picture when people understand systems thinking they can start to get responsible for their impact on the system and then of course without accountability and integrity nothing works it breaks down so you know i'm reading this great book right now called traction and there's the three laws of performance. When people know what they are expected to do and you hold them up into account for making that difference in your company and they know that if they don't produce that, they can't stay, 
you have an organization that works. It doesn't mean you shoot people for not producing. It means you coach them and mentor and train them and make it really clear and really clear what they need to do. And then if they still don't produce, then they mostly choose to leave because the environment of high alignment will not want them there. So Michael, um, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'd like you to talk about the survey results that you got right before you hired Keen Alignment. So um, two years ago, um, our corporate office across the company uh, conducted a survey, a culture survey for lack of a better word, um, and compared us versus industry average and versus uh, best, in the, best in the country place to work for. And uh, it was a very in-depth study, and some of it was like getting punched in the stomach. Um, the areas that were the most difficult to swallow, we had to look at it, was the lack of trust between uh, the team members on the floor and their supervisors that was strained, but the complete lack of trust of upper management, the belief that they, uh, upper management had their best interest at heart, that they cared about them as human beings, um, that was where it scored the worst. So there was, um, you know, back to it having to start at the top or in, in my world at the bottom, um, the survey results said exactly that. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, if, if you can't, if you don't trust that your executives have your best interest at heart, um, there's a lack of communication, a lack of coordination. It, it all goes downhill from there. So it empirically showed what I intuitively knew, and that was um, we're a culture that is declining. And given that our product is uh, basically a commodity and has very little features or benefits to differentiate it itself and uh, there's you can't really differentiate on price because it's so competitive um, what are you going to do in order to make sure that you win with a low-cost manufacturing and B um, tremendous relationships with customers is it's all about culture and it's very clear where we had to start and that was with the executives Thank you. So one of the things we did with AB and I is we started to look at the data around how the leaders were leading, what their strengths were, what their gaps were as an organization, how they got things done. And we had a little bit of an insight about this opposition and a little bit of an insight about the systems thinking when we did the organizational assessment, but then we learned a lot more through getting to know people and through talking to people and through doing these level sets. But what it allowed us to do is have a baseline of competencies and then goals to set of what needed to be improved. And this is where we began our leadership development with, this is where we began any kind of training. And then we did the level set, which is where the foundation was laid in creating breakthrough performance. So part of the level set is to clarify the purpose of what a team is, to teach people how to be response agile and get back on the horse after failing, whether it was individual, like on ropes courses and with their team, or in some of the different projects that we give them, they got an opportunity, it's very experiential, so we put them in the game or put them in an exercise or put them on a ropes course or give them a 10,000 dominoes and say, build something in an hour um, and with a lot more detail than that. And then when they fail, we debrief and we talk about where this shows up at work and how does that impact and what's the long-term impacts of that. And people start to congeal as a team. I mean, you look at these faces, people are happy, people are connected. People feel sometimes, especially at ab &I, for the first time in 30 years or 20 years that they're part of something bigger than themselves. People learn to tell the truth without making each other wrong, without blaming. It's a big piece of the level set is blame is not gonna get you anywhere. I'm um, learning to dismantle upsets and communicate in a way that is responsible and then empowering leadership. 
empowering whatever role you're in, that you are a leader. And we started with the executive team. Then we went to high potential, then we went with managers and supervisors and then high potential. And then Michael brought this to every human being in that enterprise. And some of the things that people have said, said to me, Michael, do you remember any of the comments from the long time regular uh, team members about what they experienced either during the communications or the level set training that really, that really struck you as I'm glad I did this. Um, even, even some people who uh, held out the third generation as being Camelot and, and being led by King Arthur uh, himself um, said that they've never seen a more open, honest, and and uh, and forthcoming conversations, and uh, you know, I've never seen anything like it uh, before, and uh, um, it was pretty powerful. Uh, so this this guy looking in the mirror, it, Michael. I don't know if you if you know what he does, but he is in the foundry, and this is probably some of the only training he's ever gotten, and it's really about uh, what are your blind spots? What does it mean to be a team member? What's your point of view? What does it take to be a high performer? And what does, how do I impact the organization? And so in this group, one of the exercises that we had people do is really, they, so they, they came in, foundry workers, people pouring molten metal. Um, yeah, I want it to be better, but it's up to management to make it better. It's not up to me. So one of the exercises that we really have people do is look at where do you experience breakdowns at work that you think are just at work, but where do you really experience them in your personal life, with your wife, with your husband, in your family? And we have people start to look that wherever they go, there they are, and they get that they have a choice to be responsible. Um, Michael also- So, so that, that, that picture was of uh, a gentleman about 24 years with us who operates our molding machine. And his engagement, when I talk about at the top, being critically important, that guy and his team who runs that molding machine, the difference in what they can do um, in terms of being more productive on a given day or less uh, can equate to lots and lots of dollars. He's critically important that he's engaged. So they also did, one of the things that Michael did after um, in this process was to bring the entire organization together and do a communications workshop. And so you could see the room, Michael, how many people were in the room that day, 200? I believe there were over 220. We, we, we had 240 at that time, and uh, there were a few people couldn't make it, but it was, it was, uh, it was about 5%, or 95% full. Okay, so company. it was led in English and Spanish, which made a huge difference. So literally, I was in English, and and um, the person next to me was in Spanish. And we, I said, blah, blah, blah. he said, blah, blah. and I had two different people uh, because it was a long day and a lot of people. But this is the first time ever in the history of this company, everybody got together and started to talk about what's working, what's not, and how could we make AB and I a better place. So they got, I don't know, probably 50 ideas of how to make AB and I better but also everybody, these people, foundry workers were matched with executives and, and supervisors were matched with, with uh, team members. And they really got to see how their personal thinking, if you can see my little drawing, how this is the wall of thought. Every human being, every human being, the National Science Institute says, has between 10 and 60,000 thoughts a day and 85% of them are negative. When Michael's workforce got to see that they weren't alone, that their negative thoughts were just part of being human and they weren't doing anything to interrupt those negative thoughts, they got to see that they could make a change. And when they got to see that they're not the only people that have negative thoughts, that the guy next to them, that the gal next to them, that the apartment next to them were also human and just dealing with these thoughts and again, they had a massive change in management and the person selected to lead 
wasn't giving people the same thing that his predecessor did. And so people were hurt. They felt betrayed. They felt bamboozled. And Michael came in and wanted to make changes. And he was smart enough to know he couldn't do it alone. Um, and there was a gentleman, uh, Amalius, Mr. Beltran. Do you remember what, what he said as a closing circle for this workshop? Um. Isaac Sr. is one of the most influential people in our company, and uh, he highlighted that uh, in all of his years, and he's been with us for over 40, that, uh, that this was the most committed he's, he's ever seen us in terms of wanting to make things better for the company, and that we are, as the people, the company, and it takes everybody in the room to come together to make this happen and talk about what a great gift it was. And, uh, and uh, you know, like E.F. Hutton, when Mr. Beltran speaks, everyone listens. Awesome. So, Michael, please talk about your accomplishments um, in the two years that you were working with Keen Alignment, that you are working with Keen Alignment, and then we'll wrap it up. You know, it, it, it's, it's always best to, to be able to articulate percentages and numbers and, and being less about the quote unquote touchy feely, but uh, um, it's really both. Um, we not only went through tremendous succession planning, execution, bringing leadership into roles uh, that are being replaced by the previous generation and doing that smoothly. Um, last year, we had a 32% uptick in volume, um, which caught us a bit flat-footed. And to ramp up that fast, we hired 40 new people, ran tremendous overtime. Um, we had zero back orders to customers. During that ramp up, we had zero accidents. We saw our productivity in pipe, two-inch pipe being our biggest runner, um, increased by uh, about 7% um, in terms of just productivity. And um, we were able to also, given that our competitors had back orders, we were able to sell to them and, uh, and, and maximize some opportunities. And this is all the while doing culture change, leadership growth, training, et cetera. Um, I believe had we been the um, in the teeth of our oppositional siloed culture, we would not only not have maximized those opportunities, but we would have, um, our customers would have suffered and uh, we would have left a lot of money on the table. Um, people had fun doing it. Um, so. So I want to say too, you know, I want to say what I heard um, is that you've had the, you had the best shutdown, which is where the foundry shuts down and does maintenance. Um, that people have seen in, in years and years and years and years. It was drama free, it was smooth, a new people were leading it. Um, and I think Michael said earlier, there is an entire new team of people in management that haven't been in management ever before. And the, the other thing is the young people, the young people that are choosing Foundry are some of the people stepping up and saying, wow, it feels really good to work here. And I'm really important. And I feel like I'm part of something. And, um, and you can't put a number on that, but it certainly improves safety metrics and uh, all, all, production. All, all true. Back to the chart that Maji showed with those, those seven levels. Um, our culture had been under the line in fear, frustration, and hopelessness. I would say now we are in engagement and poised to get towards innovation. Um, we're just starting. There we are. Awesome. So I'm gonna give it, we are, Keen Alignment is creating a 21 day campaign where we're sending three to five minute videos every day to your email for you to learn how to transform your culture. You know, Michael knew he couldn't do it alone. Some of you have very large departments and you can do it alone, or you just wanna learn so that you can talk to your team and say, this is what it's gonna take. Can we do this? And so please uh, take advantage of this. It's free, it's every day for 21 days. You're gonna get training and with each training comes a job aid. And then also we have a workshop coming up October 16th 
through 18th in Silicon Valley. And there's only seat for 35 people. And it's an opportunity for you to learn how to transform your culture from the inside out. It is a train the trainer program. So that being said, Michael, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate working with you. You're a role model for everyone in manufacturing, in the foundry industry, out of the foundry industry, out of manufacturing. Uh, my wish is that more and more leaders will emulate your commitment. And thank you so much for sharing today. Thank you, Maji. Appreciate you. I appreciate you too. Bye.